um, do this presentation, I guess, I mean, I, I am uh, someone who works with mathematicians, I'm not a mathematician. Um, and uh, I, so therefore, um, I'm someone who is probably a bit of a jack of all trades and master of none, um, but I have the capacity to be in the middle of translating what is being done by the modelers towards those who need to know the information and also bring requests back to the modelers for the for the modeling um, team. So, um, I, I mean, the, the modeling methods are uh, a, a, um, are what many of you are uh, aware of already. We do use statistical forecasting, um, uh, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the dynamic modeling that we uh, uh, do. And just so you, um, we are uh, on the same page. What are we doing it for from a public health perspective? Um, and there are, uh, it, it's clearly to, to uh, uh, support our um, understanding of the epidemic on which we can make recommendations and actions. And, um, uh, and for that purpose, it means it's quite detailed modeling. We're not looking at high level concepts. We're not developing concepts. We are applying concepts to, to this situation um, populating models with, um, with uh, parameters um, uh, that allow us to get as close to some kind of reality and reliable projection as we possibly can. Um, in terms of who's doing this, well, we started off with very little at the start of this. Most of what modeling we've been doing is work on emerging infectious diseases, climate change, and so on, work we've done with uh, Jan Hong Wu um, and, uh, and others in the modeling community around Canada, um, uh, but then had to step up um, models towards the, uh, the, uh, the um, um, helping to understand the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and epidemic in Canada. Um, and uh, we set up a, a, our internal modeling group which has grown over time. Um, and at the same time, or very shortly afterwards, courtesy of a meeting at the Fields Institute um, in February 14th, we set up a, um, uh, the external expert modeling group in a, to bolster our, um, our, uh, um, a, a, the expertise we were bringing with our colleagues, mostly in the academic community in, in Canada. And there are uh, some clear objectives of bringing those um, uh, th those experts together. First is validation of what we're doing. So we've got a, an expert audience to say uh, th that uh, yes, those models seem to be making sense, or alternatively, they're uh, they need correcting. Um, they enhance our capacity and continue to enhance our capacity for modeling objectives. In other words, we can um, uh, we have redundancy of modeling. So, um, and then um, uh, uh, just hopefully to continue, we end up with ha having with the external group a network of support for provinces and territories who have limited modeling uh, 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 resources and specific needs. Um, we're also networked with um, uh, with two other modeling groups, almost the uh, WHO COVID-19 modeling group and the Chief Science Advisors modeling group. The, the objectives over time uh, have evolved, of course, from the pre-vaccination period to the, um, uh, um, uh, to the post-vaccination period. Um, and the main objectives were to model scenarios to show the high level impact of the epidemic and public health measures, um, uh, then to inform um, uh, what could we do uh, after we initially close down, what public health measures do we need to have in place to lift restrictions, uh, recognizing that people restrict, lifted restrictions too soon, frequently in different provinces, 
how best to re-implement those closures, as well as providing a early warning analysis and forecasting of the epidemic as we go along, it's a rather separate objective. Most of the first three are scenario-based modeling, the, uh, the, the fourth is a more long-range forecasting and other analyses. Then again, um, uh, more scenario-based modeling of, in the post-vaccination uh, availability period with the impact of vaccination, when can we open up? And lastly, controlling the Delta-driven fourth wave more recently. And I'll go through these um, uh, uh, to some extent. Of course, the models, as I mentioned, are very much what you would be uh, familiar with, uh, by and large SEIR models, uh, which are actually um, uh, um, uh, adapted to the specific characteristics of, uh, of COVID-19 with asymptomatic transmission, pre-symptomatic transmission, um, et cetera. Um, and uh, we're, uh, they're pretty highly parameterized, some uh, depending on the type of model that we're using. We've got a, a, a range from simplistic to most complex. Um, and they are um, uh, uh, models that are, um, uh, that are, the parameters are obtained from literature uh, searches. We have a knowledge synthesis team which uh, does literature searches every day. And so we get uh, getting the updated uh, evidence uh, over time that allows us to populate the, uh, the, the parameters. But of course, some are Canadian specific and those are obtained by fitting the models to surveillance data. So most of the, what I'm gonna show, I think some of it is gonna be simplistic modeling, but most of it is, the, is out of our agent-based model, which also as well as having age structured contacts, age structured outcomes, also has um, uh, uh, some uh, aspects of the kind of uh, of the community structure with um, uh, home environments, work environments, uh, uh, common uh, 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 leisure spaces as well. So, almost chronologically, the first thing that we we did was use simplistic models um, and collecting information from colleagues in the WHO modeling group, which include people from the UK, um, uh, particularly from uh, uh, Imperial and uh, London School of Hygiene, um, uh, but also others clearly for University of Toronto colleagues. The first uh, kind of daunting impact that we have a, an emerging infectious disease, which is uh, highly transmissible against which the Canadian population has almost no immunity whatsoever, as far as we were aware, and um, uh, which has a, an, uh, a annoyingly high amount of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of infection fatality rate uh, and, uh, and severe outcomes causing hospitalization and, and so on. And so the first modeling was to, to look at that and say, well, what could we do if we had um, um, a, a higher level of, of public health uh, measures versus a low level? What would that mean for our healthcare system? And obviously that meant that at high level, we were targeting that green line uh, um, uh, in, in, and hoping that we would have technological solutions that would help us towards the end, either um, uh, therapeutics, um, uh, which we haven't, we're only just starting to see the possibility of that now, or vaccinations, but more of that in a minute. So of course, the second objective was to, to, to say, after we closed down in uh, uh, March, April, how can we lift those restrictions without um, uh, causing the epidemic to come back? And that is in re-implementing re uh, or, or strengthening other public health measures, which essentially are case detection and isolation of cases, so they don't transmit infection. And then tracing of contacts with those cases and, uh, and quarantining them so that whatever, uh, uh, the, there's limited transmission from those contacts if they had acquired infection. There was uh, also physical distancing, and we uh, 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 kind of obtained estimates of this uh, ourselves and with uh, uh, colleagues in the expert, um, expert 
external expert group um, to uh, to say, okay, when if we open up, how much do you have to lift those to be able to uh, maintain the epi epidemic under control? And um, uh, the upshot is that we were able to produce some estimates, but clearly to uh, of, of case detection, um, uh, contact tracing, quarantine, um, personal distancing, which reduces kind of model as the as a reduction in the transmission coefficient when people when contacts are made, um, in order to maintain the epidemic kind of reliably under control. This is output from the uh, uh, the agent based model, and you can see that the there's a black graph, which is the median um, output from uh, uh, depending on the uh, um, uh, on the the, the, the modeling work, a uh, hundred or so, or up to a hundred um, uh, uh, individual simulations shown by the green line. Uh, sorry, the, the the gray line. And the gray bar there was the, uh, the, the uh, sorry, the green bar is identifying the period when we had uh, restrictions. And you can see to the right that if things go wrong, then obviously that epidemic would just come back and in fact, 70% of Canadians and, um, and it would be catastrophic. Um, amongst these, I say we produced these estimates of, uh, of what, lifting restrictions did in terms of, of, uh, uh, of obtaining, uh, uh, of S, uh, sorry, of, of uh, increasing contact. So we, um, uh, with uh, pre-COVID of 12 contacts a day, if you increased um, uh, uh, opening um, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, businesses, essential businesses, it wouldn't have too much of an effect. But if you open all of those kind of leisure spaces, then you've really got to um, um, uh, ramp up your, um, uh, uh, your uh, um, testing and tracing. And I, I think it became clear that we're the, oh, and, and we're also looking at what are the, um, the uh, what are the venues that, uh, are, uh, are most safe to be uh, to, to lift restrictions, um, and uh, and of course the, the those are really the kind of um, uh, uh, oh I should the, the, these are combinations modeling combinations, but um, the um, uh, probably the most um, uh, risky. Um, uh, uh, venues to open up with those mixed age uh, leisure spaces. So um, um, that was quite a heap of work for us and for our colleagues in the external modeling group. Um, uh, but clearly, as we saw with the resurgence, the, the second wave uh, at the end of summer, or du beginning during summer 2020, that um, the those enhancements to public health measures had not taken place enough. Um, and then we had to think about providing guidance about how best to shut down um, uh, and uh, in terms of how many cases, what sort of incidents uh, is, it, it, uh, do we have to reach before we uh, act in terms of reimposing restrictive closures. And when you did that, how long uh, would um, uh, that, uh, how long should those shutdowns be? And we provided this information, but I'm not sure that it actually ended up really being used within, um, uh, within uh, uh, as, as a guidance to provincial and territorial policies, uh, which are essentially governmental dis decisions. Um, but the upshot of this modeling was that uh, uh, don't wait, de-escalate. In other words, uh, shut down um, and um, uh, if uh, and, and shut down for long enough. Uh, and, and doing that is best for the economy as well as, well as it's best for the uh, for the um, uh, for public health. We're also modeling the importation of of cases. Um, 
uh, using a, a, a kind of estimation of the of the, the dispersion of the population in the air transport system around the world and uh, estimating how many cases may be arriving at Canadian borders, uh, how many, um, uh, where and when they may be appearing and in the, uh, uh, during the control of the epidemic, how many might be getting across the border with, um, uh, with, uh, 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 with the controls that are in place. Our fourth objective throughout this was to uh, obviously provide some kind of early warning analysis and forecasting. The usual kind of um, uh, estimates of, you know, RT, what's the trajectory of uh, uh, in it right now, uh, according to our surveillance data of, uh, of the epidemic. We're also exploring the use of social media about, uh, on, about symptoms and illness to, um, uh, to help with that. There is uh, information here that on mobility that I've not included, uh, although we profited from that, but didn't do it ourselves. There's the statistical forecasts, and then there are the model, uh, dynamic model-based forecasts, which um, uh, on the basis of certain parameters, as well as model fitting, uh, said where you know where will we likely to be in the next couple of months? The fifth objective we had was uh, with vaccination. When can we open up? And this is the starting of the of probably some of the most complex modeling, which includes having uh, real information about the vaccines themselves. Now, as it turns out, that the vaccines are effective against transmission as well as effective against um, uh, uh, disease, which is just as well, because if they were just uh, effective against disease, then we'd be in a much worse situation than we are right now. Um, we had to include the uh, emergence of variants, initially the emergence of the alpha variant, and then more recently the delta variant and also the projected uh, vaccine rollout. And as time goes on, month on month, we have to update this with not just what's projected, but what has actually happened. And this is the kind of output we have from the, um, uh, for this kind of modeling, that we have different vaccine performance um, uh, scenarios, which are in terms of protection against transmission and illness, which are the vertical columns and then the rows are um, uh, the um, uh, are different levels of coverage at which we lift restrictions and as you can see at the top right with vaccine three which is not a very good one uh, controlling transmission um, and we've got relatively low vaccine coverage if you were to lift restrictions uh, then the epidemic comes back in uh, full force however if we waited with the parameters of the model uh, at this time, the, uh, uh, down at the bottom left, 75% uh, coverage in the eligible population with a, a very efficient vaccine, and you can open up uh, uh, when 75% of the population was vaccinated, which at this time we expected was about, uh, with just alpha circulating, would be a, uh, sometime uh, end of August, uh, beginning of September. And so um, this provided the, uh, I think, the, the background with, with some uh, corroboration of modeling with our external modeling team that we, this, this idea of a one dose summer and a two dose fall with some caveats uh, to that, which are the, um, you know, if actually vaccination rollout slower than we, we, we projected, or if the, there are, um, uh, uh, we get new variants emerging which are more transmissible and more virulent, that puts a bit of a spanner in the works. Uh, if we have variants that escape immunity, that, uh, that, that puts a spanner in the works uh, about the amount of, uh, of vaccine coverage we need before we can more safely open up. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, as a preamble to the next section, of course, we this is modeling presented by the uh, uh, Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Tam, 
um, that uh, without Delta, we're good to go with that sort of one dose, uh, uh, a summer, two dose, fall situation. But with the Delta um, uh, um, uh, variant, with the same amount of vaccine coverage, you can see that there are many simulations in which our uh, hospital capacity is, um, uh, is exceeded. And so uh, that requires a much greater amount of uh, vac uh, vaccine coverage. Just a word about the fourth wave, and although this actually doesn't, it actually looks like there are five waves here because of uh, uh, this is an earlier bit of uh, modeling work with the scenario. There are some clear differences between what's happening in the fourth wave. The, the first wave we've been uh, opening up and closing down uh, to control the inf uh, in, in infection, keep the, the, the epidemic in, in, in a, with a status of transmission that our uh, health capacity has is, is not breached. And as we know, in certain circumstances and certain locations, then uh, that actually has almost breached our healthcare capacity, or if not surpassed the healthcare capacity for at least for a short period of time. But then we have the um, uh, now the post uh, uh, vaccine rollout where we have a relatively high proportion of the population that are, that are, that are vaccinated, yet we're confronted with this Delta wave, um, uh, which is occurring predominantly amongst the non unvaccinated. But, and that will come to an end when the unvaccinated um, acquire infection. I think as the German health minister said that by spring, um, uh, everybody will be, or the majority of the population will either be vaccinated, recovered and immune or dead. And, uh, and that's the reality uh, of, 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 of this situation, I think. Um, so um, we recognize that the higher vaccine uptake, in other words, encouraging uh, the population to uh, get vaccinated, um, to uh, go for the, for the maximum amount of, of the population uh, vaccinated would allow us with, uh, with the, the Delta variant to, um, uh, to uh, uh, um, we would be able to open up as long as we got there before um, uh, we opened up. But I think as we know, that many provinces did actually open up before we had target um, uh, uh, vaccine coverage. And that allowed the, 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 the Delta driven fourth wave to begin. And then it's kind of too late to, as we discovered, to actually try and implement increased vaccination coverage to control the, the fourth wave because Delta variant is so transmissible. And because it's um, uh, in order to get optimal immunity, you need a two month interdose interval uh, and there's a bit of a lag, so therefore quite a considerable lag time before uh, increased uptake of vaccination is gonna have um, uh, enough impact to, uh, to actually control the wave. Obviously, um, increasing vaccination coverage will contribute to reaching herd immunity uh, as we get into 2022 to, uh, uh, to mean that we're in a better position to, to lift our public health measures. Um, we've also, uh, with, so we can't vaccinate our way out of the fourth wave, but what we can do, clearly vaccination is having an impact. Um, and as we have seen, relatively light touch public health measures uh, in for the, much of the population, masking, maintaining distancing, maintaining gathering uh, uh, occupancy sizes, uh, limits, um, uh, has been able to keep this uh, a, a wave under control. And also in the uh, modeling world, vaccine proof requirements are also very effective, um, not really by driving uh, increased uptake of vaccination because we don't have some really robust data on, on that as far as I'm aware, but simply because it stops the unvaccinated gathering in venues where transmission is very likely. So those places like 
bars, restaurants, theatres, gyms, where people are inside together, close, often either vocalising or uh, uh, breathing heavily and getting, uh, letting um, uh, um, uh, um, um, you know, facilitating the production of aerosols from infected people. Now, vaccine proof requirements don't stop. The, um, uh, the unvaccinated, that's not a means of protecting the unvaccinated from acquiring infection, but it slows down the transmission uh, of, um, uh, of, of, of SARS-CoV-2, um, allowing uh, the, um, uh, keeping the healthcare system uh, uh, better protected and allowing, having an impact on health, really by allowing the healthcare system to do its normal job for non-COVID-19 uh, um, uh, uh, health issues. So uh, just summarizing the fourth wave is uh, that we're seeing at the moment and people talking about the fourth and the fifth wave, whereas really the fifth wave is still the Delta driven wave. It's just that we closed down and then we're starting to open up again, we're seeing cases increase again. Uh, uh, but this is mostly of the unvaccinated. Um, uh, it'll end when we have uh, 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 essentially herd immunity um, uh, or approaching essentially effective herd immunity. Um, and at that point, we start to transition and we expect to transition from an epidemic to an endemic disease. Um, getting those, we can't vaccinate our way out of it, um, uh, but essentially, um, uh, as long as we maintain with some public health measures, vaccine proofs, um, some kind of control on the epidemic, uh, then uh, eventually we will get to a level of immunity in the population, which should allow us to lift those um, uh, restrictions more and get back to a bit more of a more normal life. Um, however, clearly there are things down the road that we are gonna have to take into consideration. Um, the, uh, um, we're going to have an endemic situation because we will have reintroduction of cases from travel. We'll have waning immunity. We're seeing the uh, early uh, signs of this around the world. Um, probably in Canada, better placed because of that, just by happenstance, that two month interdose interval uh, that provides a, an almost optimum um, uh, uh, immunity. And so we're seeing very little uh, waning immunity to com compared to. Uh, some parts of the world. Recruitment of naive children by births will be happening. Uh, immune escape variants will be, will be happening. And this is probably going to be uh, expected um, uh, um, ex expected seasonal patterns, seasonal transmission. So um, uh, we are in the process of, uh, of re- uh, uh, formatting our models to be able to do this kind of um, uh, modeling. And I think uh, that uh, that is where I will end. As, I say, we'll, as far as uh, end state scenarios, we have best case ones in which waning immunity is slow and worst case ones in which waning immunity is fast. And that, and that when we know more about that, then we'll be better positioned to know how we're gonna be able to uh, tackle this with uh, any boosters allowing people to acquire infection naturally by sort of allowing natural boosting, but we will have to have more information to be able to, um, uh, to model this in any other way than just a scenario. And uh, for those of you interested, we have uh, a lot of this information on the uh, National Collaborating Centre for Infectious Diseases website. So I'll stop there and I don't know, Jan Hong and uh, uh, Jimmy, if there are uh, any questions that you people want to ask of me. Maybe I can make a first comment and show there are a lot of questions. Um, I just want to uh, say, first of all, Nick, uh, it has been a privilege of working with you, you and your colleagues for our almost two decades now. And uh, uh, Public Health Agency of Canada was, uh, was created almost 20 years ago, shortly after SARS, and uh, um, with tremendous effort of your colleagues. And this time, uh, really, uh, your leadership, uh, the 
mathematic modeling has been playing a significant role in um, informing the policy and decision making at the highest level. And I want to congratulate you on this. Um, I, you, in the past, you keep asking me recommendation of some good postdoc teacher student to be recorded in your group. And some of them are successful and some of them could not take uh, the, the offer from the, your agency. Now you have the Fields Institute and uh, the, the network has hired a, a larger group of postdocs <laughs> and for you um, dispatch. And uh, uh, well, the purpose of this uh, network is really creating a, a capacity that uh, can provide right response response uh, from the modeling community point of view. And uh, we will uh, regularly highlight some of the projects and the achievements of our postdocs and graduate students in our uh, networks newsletter. So uh, that will be our recommendation to you. So when uh, all the postdocs and students know uh, uh, modeling and supporting the decision and uh, uh, logistic implementation is still our top priority. So uh, feel free to, to use in this excellent pool of talents, uh, Nick. So with that, I, I will pass on to the students. Thank you, Jan Hong. Uh, you over flattered me perhaps, and, uh, but I'm fully aware that, uh, that it, it's, uh, the, there's a, a a, an increasing pool of talented people out there for us to, 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 to draw on. And I hope that uh, uh, in the future, we're gonna be able to provide uh, more and more careers for, uh, for modelers within the, the federal government, but also in uh, pro provincial and territorial governments as well. True. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Uh, without saying so much, I want to ask anyone who has a question to ask uh, Dr. Hogde questions. So, Martin, your hand is raised. Okay. Uh, you yeah. mentioned previously that you'd um, you'd had some collaboration with Imperial and LS um, LSHTM. Uh, how much? Uh, how much kind of collaboration was there with, say, USCDC or PHE of UK? Those kinds of other public health agencies. I don't. I don't think we um, uh, uh, we co collaborated directly with uh, LSTHM and, uh, uh, and and Imperial, other than through the WHO working group. But but we did kind of ask for advice and input and so on. So it was a it kind of them advising us probably more than collaborating um, uh, at the, uh, in the early stages, but we were, we were grateful for that input. Um, uh, as far as kind of international uh, collaborations, have we actually worked together? Well, uh, we have worked, I mean, I've had c collaborations and some of my staff have got more clear links with the South African uh, Center for Epidemio Epidemiological Modeling and Analysis. Um, and so we've had uh, sort of links with them for, uh, for some of the modeling work. Uh, we, have, um, uh, uh, we have had discussions with our international partners in Australia. There's some very good modeling in, uh, 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 going on in Australia and Australian universities. Um, some of that has been adopted and adapted for, uh, particularly in terms of, uh, of uh, being able to, to, to use modeling to predict kind of um, PPE requirements and so on, uh, 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 pharmaceutical requirements. Um, there is, um, um, a, a, as far as CDC is concerned, they generally had a focus on, uh, on forecasting and forecasting at national and state level. And, uh, and so what they did is to have, uh, is to, to basically give funding to universities to pr provide them with, uh, with, with, um, with forecasts. 
Um, so whereas a lot of our work has been more on, at least initially, it was on scenarios rather than forecasting. We kind of came together a little bit, and now we have regular meetings to get to, to together. But 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 there are there are some differences in the way we approach uh, uh, the the modelling and how it feeds into uh, into policies. Thank you for the response. I think before calling the next. Uh question, I should ask this question. So I have two questions, uh, Dr. Hawking. The first one is, um, you mentioned that um, COVID is gradually becoming endemic. So I was just wondering like, when it eventually becomes endemic in the population, what do we expect in terms of vaccination? So is it gonna be uh, six, every six months vaccination or is it gonna be, or yearly or how is that gonna be? That's the first question. And the second question is, uh, I don't know if there is an ongoing work or future work considering, this is just from my curiosity, considering the impact of COVID on influenza, because I remember when I was going to take a flu shot, I'm like, huh, we have to take shot and shot and shot throughout this year. So I'm just wondering, is there any study considering the impact of COVID on uh, flu and probably the co-interaction of these two? I mean, negatively and positively. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so uh, good questions. And the, 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 um, uh, as far as the vaccination thing, uh, the booster vaccination question, um, it's, it's a bit of a, a, at the moment, it's an unknown quantity. So how long, after a vaccination against COVID, do we remain um, uh, protected? Uh, and the initial studies suggest that with the, with the, for an mRNA vaccine with a three week interdose interval, then about six months, you're starting to, to wane immunity. Five, five months, you're starting to wane immunity and able to acquire infection and maybe at least for a short period of time, transmit it. I have some questions about whether that is just simply the way the vaccines behave, um, uh, firstly. Um, to what extent does that mean that you're then vulnerable to severe outcomes? Um, and to what extent does that, if you were to model that the uh, immunity wanes to zero, then it means that you know, as soon as everybody's immunity wanes to zero, because we got the vaccine out in a fairly short period of time, then suddenly it'll come back when everybody's immunity has waned. And, and we, but we, we don't know. It's probably an implausible situation that, 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 that immunity will wane in that way. So really we're, we're, we're modeling scenarios at the moment, but what we really need is more long-term data to understand the um, uh, the duration of, uh, of of immunity and what that means in terms of transmission and in terms of protection against severe outcomes because it honestly if, if we get only mild infections with waning immunity by and large well who cares um, uh, it, it's it's a little bit you know like the flu situation where you will need to vaccinate those who are for whom waning immunity might mean a more serious infection, so it's a, um, uh, a uh, um, only those parts of the population who are most vulnerable. Um, clearly, the, the, there has been a lot of concern about the, and there will continue to be this uh, winter, uh, much concern about the this winter the combined impact of uh, of uh, uh, of influenza and. Uh, uh, and COVID. Certainly the previous winter, we saw almost no flu because of the public health measures that were in place. Um, and uh, some can argue that maybe there will be knock-on effects because of that, because people did not have either natural boosting from influenza, um, and maybe that's going to have an effect. Um, so uh, I think we, we will just have to see. I have no, we, we we do not have a great deal of information, um, uh, curiously less information on flu than we do on 
uh, on um, uh, on uh, uh, COVID now to be able to kind of model them together. Thank you so much for the response. Yeah. And uh, we have one hand raised. Okay, Mackenzie, the question. Yes, thank you so much for your presentation. And it's great to see how modeling is really informing policy decisions. Um, I'm working with Mr. Mr. Mishra's team at Unity Health, and we are also modeling um, the impact of specific vaccination strategies in Ontario. Um, so I'm interested in primarily uh, how you're modeling contacts in in some of your models and whether there's any empirical data that's informing contact rates in, um, in your models or whether it's you know, polymod or prem projections. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll ask that question first. Yeah, but yeah, polymod prem, yes, is, 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 is the, the, uh, the, the main source of that. Mm -hmm. Although, um, and I'm not sure whether they've been updated yet. Clearly, uh, Amy Greer and colleagues at, uh, uh, have uh, uh, been doing um, uh, uh, um, surveys to see how people's contacts have changed during the, the epidemic, and uh, and to which will, will will help to refine the models as well, particularly in retrospect. Um, uh, Mark Grisson at uh, Université de Laval has also been doing these uh, surveys to kind of update uh, the, um, the, the, the these contract matrices from uh, from survey data to get a bit of you know to see how people are responding to the epidemic and how they're you know when you lift restrictions do they go back to, to normal or do they not so right so so I'm wondering for your intervention of um, of lockdown. Or, or like whether you're going to lift that restriction or not, is it kind of a parameter that you include in the model? And you know, you say if we lift uh, measures, mobility contact increases by fifty percent, sixty percent, and thus contact rates also increase by that. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, okay. They remain. They remain um, uh, um, by and large kind of the, uh, the same age structure. Mm -hmm. Although obviously in the agent based model that can be um, uh, adapted so that because um, uh, different age structures are occurring in different um, uh, in different environments and they can be shut down selectively. Right. Yes. My second question is around um, what you brought up towards the end about how our vac some of our vaccination policies, specifically, you know. Um, requiring mandates that people are vaccinated to gather in certain settings. Um, my question is about that actual assumption, whether those policies actually result in what we would expect happens and without perhaps enforcement. Um, so I know while the mandate is present, there have been many instances where I, I go to a restaurant and I never get asked for my proof of vaccination. So I'm wondering if there's any research that has been done to actually assess whether the interventions that we're implementing are having the impact that we think they're having. And I think it's it's um, it's interesting that, you know, in a lot of our models, we have these parameters and we make assumptions about how they're going to have an effect on our population. But sometimes we don't take, take a step back and ask, is it actually having that impact that we think it's going to have. Um, so I was wondering. Since... Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen any, any any kind of data to say, well, you know, we'll, and it, it, it's actually quite difficult to tease apart, I think, because the, the, the uh, vaccine proof requirements have generally been implemented roughly the same time as some kind of increasing um, uh, um, stringency of, uh, of uh, kind of distancing and, and, and other restrictions. So I think it's pretty difficult to tease apart. Okay, thank you. But it would be good to know, uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you. And um, Corinne has a question. Do you want to ask in person? Should I read your question, Corinne? Um, 
I can I can say it. So just on that point, I was wondering then, I have a different question after, but do, do the scenario analysis that you're doing then account for that non-compliance? Or is that just assumed can, like we, it'll be policy-based? You, you can, you can um, uh, uh, we can model compliance, right? That, which is just, you know, what's the percentage of the population to, that actually does that? What does, uh, and vaccine mandates essentially mean that unvaccinated people don't go into those congregate spaces. Um, what we can't model is that they actually congregate somewhere else, um, and uh, uh, which would reduce the impact. Um, so th there is, um, uh, uh, there, there, there may come, come a limit to what modeling can tell us, actually, because it, as it becomes very, very complicated, um, and it, it and it is becoming very complicated with uh, uh, obviously the more complicated models are the more possibility that you've got multiple confounding and compounding errors that uh, that, that send it off in a trajectory that is uh, that is unhelpful we haven't got there yet i don't think but uh, but it's clearly that the more uncertain the more parameters you have the more uncertain parameters you have, the more uh, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it's difficult to apply the modeling outcomes to policies. Yeah, and, and so I have a couple of questions. Um, I, I really like that you were bringing up the, the difference between obviously like projections and, and forecasting. And so one of the questions I have is like, first of all, in Canada, do we have an idea about what our forecast horizon is? Um, is there an interest in kind of defining what that is? And how do we want to pair it with scenario analysis, which may be more useful for potentially these longer term worst case scenarios, which, you know, otherwise we can't generate long term forecasts for. Um, and then related to, I guess, all of these points is my question of whether or not there are potentially demands, and that might be too strong of a word, but um, <laughs> that there might be like a, a desire to have something that we can't produce, let's say by people working in decision making. And therefore, like, what are those? And is there any way to get closer to meeting them? That was a lot, but. <laughs> yes, and I'm not quite sure I've got the last one, but I'll come to it. So I'll do the, the uh, I think the further you go out, the more it becomes in terms of forecasting, long range forecasting, the more it is a scenario. Um, uh, it, so it, essentially, we look at our long range scenarios with perhaps three, um, uh, three scenarios. You've seen these presented by Dr. Tan with the, uh, this is the trajectory we're on for the next couple of months. This is the, uh, what might happen if uh, recent changes increase effective contacts by 15% and what happens if actually uh, they decrease contacts by 15%. So, um, and then we do a forecast that goes out perhaps six weeks and at the most two months. Because beyond that, it is a scenario that, that, that you know, the, the likelihood, and I, I guess perhaps some provinces would go, if it's getting out of control and not do anything, but other provinces would would act. Uh, and so it, th those are simply scenarios, really. Once you get beyond uh, uh, two months, it's, a, it's, it's just a hypothesis. Um, yeah, and just related quickly to that, though, that if your initial condition uncertainty is so high, I always wonder, like, even in those scenarios, it's still questionable, can you account for that full range of uncertainty, it must be incredibly challenging. I think yeah, I think you have to illustrate it in in, in some kind of intervals around those uh, the, those forecasts. It's not a line; it's a fan. Um, so um, the um, and and we have to be careful uh, in communicating that uncertainty. Um, uh, one of the things that has been quite marked about the uh, COVID-19 epidemic from our perspective is how kind of modelable it has been. In other words, it has behaved remarkably consistently with what modelling has, um, uh, has, um, uh, ha has um, 
uh, uh, projected, um, which means that we uh, our parameters are not far off. Uh, they're relatively accurate. If they weren't, then we would be producing uh, um, projections uh, that are not realized in real life. As it turns out, that the, the um, modeling that does that is, of course, interesting and useful because it identifies that your pre preconceived knowledge about the system is incorrect. And, the, the, and sometimes that's a more interesting finding that, that, that you're, and, and that raises ideas about what, what pieces of this transmission cycle do we need more information on in order to, to model it. I'm getting a little off track here. Um, the, uh, um, I think we may be getting there a little bit towards that, um, uh, the, uh, modeling it as a tool to identify where our research needs and our research funding should go to. But uh, again, getting even further off track. Um, sorry, what was your, uh, Karin, what was your uh, other question? Yeah, so my last question is kind of related to that. It's more like the mismatch. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about this between like what is being asked by, let's say, decision makers, policy makers versus what we can produce. So I was wondering if you've had experiences yeah. with that tension. Um, yes, uh, yes and no. Um, I, I think early on there was uh, expectations of, of uh, sometimes from kind of senior managers about what the modeling can tell you. However, um, and I think one of the things that has been uh, very uh, kind of encouraging for, for, for me, in fact, for all of us, is how much modeling has played a central role in, uh, in our understanding collectively and decision-making in this epidemic. And by and large, it's because the modeling work that's been done has been good, not by me, but my team and by other teams around the, uh, around the country. Um, and uh, that it has produced um, uh, uh, output that's been re demonstrably reliable uh, on which to make, uh, to make decisions. Um, so, uh, um, but, but clearly, uh, it, uh, um, with that has, um, there are non-specialist, non-modeler type public health people who've started to realize actually and start to understand modeling more. And, uh, and with that increasing understanding, I think uh, a, a, a greater recognition of what modeling can offer and not expecting too much of it. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the responses. That was uh, great. So uh, do we have one last short question? Very short. <laughs> Anyone? OK. So I guess no more questions. All right. So since we have no more questions, I guess maybe we have long questions, but I requested for short questions. <laughs> OK. So uh, to wrap up, I'm going to call on Professor Hu to uh, wrap up the talk. Is he online? Oh, I did not prepare for that, but, uh, <laughs> but, but thank you. I'm, I'm very sorry. happy to you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to, on behalf of you, to, to extend, you. <laughs> extending our uh, invitation to Nick to constant return uh, for uh, your consultation and uh, again, just uh, also for your uh, uh, choice of you, um, uh, you, you, you work force in your agency and, uh, and uh, we will have a larger network meeting and uh, very soon we will engage uh, again, uh, Dr. Ogden and, uh, and your colleagues in, a, 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 in another capacity very soon. And uh, I want to, again, Jumi, I want to thank you and uh, uh, this network for, for bringing Dr. Nickton to us. Thank you. Thank you again for coming. So this is the end of the talk. And hopefully we have Dr. Hogan next time we call you, you will answer us. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I may not have anything new to say. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> and come to visit us physically. <laughs> Soon. Yeah. That will be nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, everyone, this is the end of the seminar. Next week, uh, we'll be happy to hear you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.